And it is an honour to be here today. I think it's probably quite rare for a climate change campaigner to be invited to a conference about happiness. Most people find it too depressing. But I suspect that many of you, if not all of you, are here because you're thinking not just about your own happiness, but also the happiness of others. Am I right? Are there people here who have a hope that we can leave clean air, fresh water, healthy soil for future generations? Yeah. Well, I share that dream, and that's why I'm here with you today. My story starts three hours north of here. I was born in the world's biggest coal export port, in Newcastle. Every week, 31 coal megaships carrying 100,000 tonnes of coal leave from that port. And that coal is burned, it goes into the atmosphere, it makes climate change worse. I used to surf every morning before school with my best friend, and we would watch the sunrise, and in between us and the sun would be these coal ships. And it just seemed normal for me at the time. But I didn't spend all my time in Newcastle, because my mum's family are farmers. And so I was really lucky, as a, a little kid, to be able to spend time on my grandparents' farm and my uncle's farm in northwestern New South Wales. So I knew what made me happy as a child. It was camping under the river Red Gums. It was swimming in the creek. It was running through fields of wheat as far as the eye could see. It was riding horses. And I learned back then that the environment, it's not something separate from us. It's what gives us our water, our food, our air. It is our survival. Humans and nature are inseparably linked. But something happened when I was in primary school that changed those rural communities that I'd been part of, that affected those people, salt of the earth, good-hearted people in rural and regional Australia, and that changed me. And that was the drought. When I was in primary school, we used to bring gold coin donations to school one day every week, and they were donated to people in Africa who didn't have enough food. But I remember when our teachers told us that there was something happening in our own backyard and that those gold coins were going to start going to a community in regional New South Wales called Manila, where there were five-year-old children who'd never seen rain. The drought affected every aspect of rural and regional communities. For people in the city, it meant higher fruit and veggie prices. But for people in the country, it meant communities being ripped apart, people losing their properties to the bank. My grandparents were lucky they were able to sell their farm, but many other farmers couldn't do that. They lost their land. And it meant a lot of farmers suiciding. And this is still happening today. Over two-thirds of Queensland right now is categorised as a drought-affected area. I was looking at the map this morning, and it's just this swathe of red over most of Queensland. And whilst Bob Catter and I disagree on many things, when I hear him talking, as he does, about the one farmer every four weeks in drought-affected Queensland that takes his own life, my heart breaks just as much as his. And each of these stories is tragic. In February, there was one farmer who was about to send his 400 cattle to market in Queensland, and he was told that they were too emaciated to be sold. And he shot every one of his cattle, and then he shot himself. And it's stories like these that remind me why climate change is a human story. It is about polar bears, it is about animals, but it's also about humans. It's about our survival. 
And it's certainly not an issue about left versus right. It's an issue that unites all of us in this common challenge. For example, who here eats food? <laughs> Many of you. <laughs> Hopefully all of you. 40% uh, of our food in Australia comes from the Murray-Darling Basin. And scientists are telling us that if we continue business as usual, we're looking at agricultural declines in that region of between 92 and 97% by the end of the century. So I was starting to learn about this in high school in Newcastle, and I was never good at science, but my science teacher told us about the greenhouse effect, told us about climate change. And I remember learning the basic science. When we burn fossil fuels like coal, it traps heat in the atmosphere, so things get hotter, it supercharges the water cycle, and it means that things like droughts get hotter and longer, creates the conditions for bushfires, and when all that moisture that's meant to be in the soil is actually up in the air because we've had too much evaporation, it tends to come down in bigger floods. And I remember thinking, wow, this is pretty serious. I was maybe 10 at the time. If we don't solve this, what is this going to mean for our future? And there's probably one person in the audience today, or maybe more than one, who has felt like I felt back then. Like there was this big challenge that you wanted to do something about, and you knew was so important, but you didn't know where to start. Has anyone felt like that? Well, for a year or a few years, I just kind of sat on this and didn't know what to do. And then one day, I just decided to start small. And so with a group of friends, we set up a, a little club at our school, went to a school called Merriweather High School. We set up a club called the Merriweather Greenies. And our challenge was to make our, our school more sustainable. We set up recycling and composting, native vegetation around the school grounds. We had opposition. We had the year 11 boys, they set up the Merriweather Industrialists. <laughs> they didn't do much though, except put posters around the school and try to annoy us. But we were successful in starting all of those sustainability initiatives, and so we thought we were ready to take on something bigger. So we took on BHP and the State Government of New South Wales. <laughs> BHP wanted to build a new mine about 40 minutes north of our school. And the state government, Bob Carr was premier at the time, were going to let them. Now, our little high school group got involved in a campaign with the traditional owners, the Warramai people, with a local group of residents who we called the Grumpy Old Men, and with the local environment group, the Wilderness Society. And it was a long campaign. It seemed so at the time when I was so young. But we did all of your traditional campaigning. We had a petition that we took around to everyone in Newcastle, we dropped a banner off the highest building in Newcastle, which was the council car park. <laughs> we dressed up as koalas and we got in the paper. We then dressed up as bush rangers and got in the paper again. We quickly realised that if you dressed up as anything, you would get in the paper. <laughs> and somehow this campaign came together and by the time I finished my final exams, we'd won. That place was protected, uh, managed by the war on my people. The mine didn't go ahead. And even though it was such a long time I tell, ago, I tell you that story because it taught me a fundamental truth that I have carried with me every single day since then, which is that we live in a country where change can come from the bottom up. It doesn't have to come from the top down. And I took that understanding and I, I went to uni just over here at Sydney Uni and I got involved in the Student Environment Collective here. And we ran a campaign to get our university to do more on climate change. We asked our vice chancellor to invest more in renewable energy, to have more research and development on campus, to have a bigger sustainability department. We camped on the front lawns, those lovely front lawns that Sydney University cherishes so much. We set up about 100 tents until security dragged us off. And we held the first student referendum since the 60s, where 97% of students voted for the university 
to take bigger steps on climate change. And eventually, after two years of campaigning, again we won and the university agreed to invest a million dollars in renewable energy research and development right here on campus. The end of that year, we'd been working not just with students at Sydney University, but also students in other parts of Australia, and they were all getting victory after victory after victory in terms of campus clean energy policies. And I found myself in Montreal at the Kyoto Protocol negotiations because the Canadian government had invited young climate change campaigners from around the world to come to be a part of it. And it was the first time that I'd realised that the kind of work my friends and I had been doing in Australia was happening all around the world. In almost every country, young people were rising up and saying, this is our challenge, this is our future, we must be at the front and centre of solving it. And at the time, I thought I'd be a lawyer because I was studying law and I thought environmental law was probably the way to go. But I had a conversation that changed my life that I want to share with you. It was with a friend of mine called Ben, who's from an island called Kiribati in the Pacific. And we were all talking about what we wanted to do with our lives. And some people wanted to be journalists, some people wanted to be scientists or lawyers or campaigners. And I guess we were talking about what would make us happy and would make us feel like we were fulfilling our, our purpose. And Ben, who's normally not very talkative, was really quiet, and I asked him why. And he said, you're talking about your future like you've got one. He said, my island, where I was born, where my grandparents are buried, where I want to have kids of my own, is less than a metre above sea. And if we continue business as usual, there is no future. And that's when I decided that working within our existing legal frameworks was not enough. We needed to change the law, not just implement it. Came back to Australia and with a group of young people, very small number of people, less than what we have in the front row here today, we set up the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. And we started small, but we aimed high. I remember doing a first radio interview about the Youth Climate Coalition saying, we just set up an organisation that would fundamentally change Australian politics forever. It was, it was day two and we had about 40 members. <laughs> but AYCC has gone on to grow and to now work with over 100,000 young people around Australia who are implementing climate change solutions in their schools, universities and communities and demanding that politicians and business leaders follow their lead. When I got a bit older, I obviously had to retire from the AYCC. And I ended up with this opportunity. I got a phone call from the ABC, and they asked if I wanted to go on a journey with Australia's former finance minister, a man with whom I don't have much in common, Nick Minchin. He is in many ways responsible for the Liberal Party's current position on climate change. And all his life had rejected climate science. But I remember reading a book as a kid, the, the amazing book, To Kill a Mockingbird, and I remember Atticus Finch saying to Jem, never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. So I agreed to spend a month with Nick, taking him around the world, introducing him to climate change scientists, to people who were being affected, and to let him introduce me to people who he respected. On the last day of our journey together, Nick and I were walking along a beach at Heron Island, and I said, what would you do if you were me? If you were a young person who was staring down the barrel of a future defined by climate change, what would you do? And we were able to find that day some common ground, because he started talking about renewable energy and how there were many reasons to move away from coal and towards renewables not just climate change, but also health. And it taught me that we need, as a movement of people who care about this issue, 
not just to fight against our opponents, we're fighting for them too. We want their kids to have clean air too. We want them to be part of the solution. We can't solve this if it's just a small number of people in society. We want everyone to have a future where the conditions for happiness are still alive. Food, water, clean air, healthy soil. So we are starting to make some progress in Australia, despite the difficult conditions of this government in particular. But communities are starting to stand up against the fossil fuel industry. Last week, the people of Bentley in New South Wales had a huge victory when they stopped a gas company from drilling. And just yesterday, communities like Sea Spray in regional Victoria are celebrating because of a massive community campaign that led to the Victorian Energy Minister saying there'll be a 12-month moratorium on all decisions related to unconventional gas. So I can guarantee you that there are people who feel the same way as us all around Australia who will keep fighting for a safe climate future and for an end to fossil fuels. And I will be with them every step of the way in my new role as Earth Hour because I am sick of hearing from politicians that we can't afford to move away from fossil fuels, that we can't afford to change the status quo, that we can't afford to stop thinking our futures in coal. Because the truth is, we can't afford not to tackle climate change. For the sake of our regional communities, our farmers, places we love like the Great Barrier Reef, and the food that we all eat, we must tackle this problem. If we want to see the future, the truth is we have to stop looking down mining pits and start looking up at the sun and the wind and the huge potential we have in Australia to lead the world in clean energy. So let me finish by saying how important you are in this transition. All of you here has the power to create enormous change. I've seen people with no money, no titles, nothing except a dream, create enormous change in their own communities. You don't need to be a CEO. You don't need to have a fancy title. You all know, probably in your own heart, what your next step is. I don't need to tell you what it is, because there are so many ways you can help your community, your organization, make progress on climate change. And I know one thing, we can't do anything alone. But if we work together, we can be very powerful. Now, when we're talking about happiness, I know with climate it can feel overwhelming. It, it, let's be honest, it's not a happy topic. And I know that the odds are against us. But as Bill McKibben says, if you're a betting person, you might bet that we would lose. But that is not a bet that a morally aware person is allowed to make. So every day, we can ask ourselves, what can I do to help change those odds? And even when people tell you that solving climate change is impossible, you can tell them that we have to do the impossible to avoid the unimaginable, and that those who say it can't be done should get out of the way of those already doing it. <laughs>